I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not so typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcasts, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Hi there, and welcome to Once Upon a Gene. I'm so grateful you're here. My name is Effie Parks, and I am your host for this show. The day this episode comes out, I'm going to be attending the Rare Disease Fair in Seattle. Looking forward to seeing some friends from near and far, including Wendy Erler, all the way from Boston. She was in the last storytelling episode, episode 183. So my friend Carolina Summers, she's a rare disease mom, and she has a foundation called Born a Hero, and she pulls together the Seattle Rare Disease Fair every year, and it is fabulous. So if you're thinking, hmm, I wonder if I could do something like that, definitely get in touch with her at rarediseasefair.com. I'm super happy to introduce you to my guest today. And speaking of Wendy Erler, she introduced me to him. He's an avid writer and communicator. His rare disease has made him adaptable, resilient, and compassionate. He lives with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and symptoms started when he was a senior in high school, and he ignored them until he couldn't any longer. Please enjoy my conversation with Chris and Selma. Hi, Christopher. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Effie. I'm looking forward to chatting. Our mutual friend, Wendy Erler, patient advocate angel with Alexion Pharmaceuticals, introduced us. And anytime Wendy has a referral, I don't question it. Yeah, Wendy's awesome. Yeah. How did you meet Wendy? It was through my job at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. My former role, I worked with biotech and pharma companies and had the opportunity to collaborate with Wendy when she was at a previous company. And we've just stayed in touch ever since. She's a really great person, a wonderful resource. And uh, I always enjoy the opportunity to, to chat with her. And then when she mentioned, obviously, you, I knew, again, kind of the same thing, that there's definitely a connection uh, I wanted to make. Yes. Well, hey, I'd love to kind of start at the beginning and get a little bit of background around your diagnosis that was semi-adult onset. So can you kind of start there from, I guess, when you were 18? Yeah. So I have something called, well, it has many names. It's, it's now known as limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2B. So the thing to know about limb girdle is that it has multiple subtypes. Uh, I have a specific subtype that deals with lack of dysferlin gene. So it's also known as dysferlinopathy. And... I was diagnosed when I was 18 years old. It was the result of a car accident, actually, my, se my senior year of high school. It was all a very fluke occurrence. I, at the time, did not even know I had any sort of underlying condition. So just to kind of level set, I was playing sports. I played basketball. I had full mobility. I had no idea that I had an underlying medical condition until I was in the car accident, at which point I was in the hospital. I wasn't injured too badly from the accident, but right as I was about to be discharged, doctor came rushing in saying, you know, we had done routine blood work, your creatine kinase levels are completely off the charts. And of course, I didn't know what that meant, but basically saying that they thought that I might have suffered some sort of internal injury. So they wheeled me back into the x-ray room, did more x-rays. Moral of the story is they couldn't find anything internally wrong with me, but they thought that the results were very atypical. So they sent me for further testing. And next thing I know, you know, I'm seeing an endocrinologist, I'm seeing a rheumatologist, I'm having a thigh biopsy all within the span of a few months. And for a while, they had no idea what was wrong. But they eventually diagnosed me with, at the time, what's called dysferlinopathy. Just basically that I'm missing this dysferlin gene, which aids in muscle cell membrane repair. And of course, all of that sounded very strange to me. I didn't really know what that meant. And they said, you know, this is something that will affect you later in life. Don't worry about it, because I was right about to go to college. And they said, you know, just don't become a bodybuilder. Don't run marathons. But as long as you don't do anything super strenuous like that, you should be fine. You won't have any symptoms. 
So I kind of took them at their word. I didn't really think about it for the next few years. Went to college, had no symptoms really until kind of the very end. Looking back, I kind of noticed that, you know, towards the end of my, my college days, things were getting a little bit tougher, but it wasn't pronounced enough where I could be like, oh, okay, those, that's the symptoms of my disease. I thought that I was maybe out of shape. It's a very stressful time when you're about to graduate and you're trying to find a job and everything. So I just chalked it up to that. So, you know, the symptoms kind of began after graduation. When I was moving to a new apartment, I was carrying my desk chair up a flight of stairs and I noticed that you know, my legs were starting to get tired. And, you know, just things like that over the next few months kind of made me start to think that maybe it was the disease that I had been diagnosed with several years before. I'd already forgotten the name of the disease, so I kind of had to go through my medical records to try to piece together what they had originally said. And I saw a neurologist. I was living in Boston at the time. And they said, you know, yeah, this is definitely, you know, this muscle disease that you're diagnosed with a few years back. It's actually, instead of, you know, later in adulthood, it's actually starting to happen now. And <laughs> the doctor is a very, they have a great bedside manner. He kind of just, as a matter of factly said, you know, you'll probably be in a wheelchair in the next 10 years. So all of a sudden you go from thinking, okay, I might have this condition that might affect me later in life to finding out, wait a minute, it's not only happening now, it's happening much faster than I thought it would. And that, you know, 10 years from now, my life is going to look drastically different than it does today. So that was definitely a wake up call. It was very difficult to deal with. And it kind of opened Pandora's box of all sorts of, of, negative emotions, trying to figure out exactly what that meant and, and what I should do from there. There's a lot to unpack there. There is. There is. <laughs> I think about you being this young dude going off to college after this accident and getting this diagnosis. And I wonder, was this thing like kind of this dark, looming elephant in the room always? But then again, it must not have been because you hadn't even remembered the name of the diagnosis. So like you blocked it out like you put it on a shelf and you locked it away yeah i don't know exactly why i did that i think looking back i think just the fact that i was out going off to college and i just had so much else to think about and the fact that it wasn't supposed to happen at that moment kind of allowed me to kind of push it off to the side out of my mind and i think also i just didn't understand the full magnitude of what they were saying so i thought that it was something where you know i might lose a little bit of strength but as long as i could manage it I'd be okay, or I'd be able to keep the strength I had. I never really considered or contemplated what it would mean to actually lose the strength I had. I just assumed at worst, maybe it would just be a matter of I wouldn't be able to become super strong, but as long as I could, you know, function day to day, I'd be okay. I think just a lot of it was just not really putting in the research to kind of understand what was happening. But at the same time, in a way, I'm almost glad I didn't do that because I don't think I would have handled it as well had I really understood and internalized what was going to happen to me. So in some respects, I'm almost happy. I was a little bit naive at that early moment. But when I finally realized kind of the full magnitude of what was going on, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I kind of did chastise myself a little bit for for not kind of thinking it through soon. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword where just on one hand, being naive made the final realization more difficult, but at the same time, you know, I don't, I don't want to have known all that was going to happen. And I'm kind of happy that I kind of had a little bit of time where I could just live carefree, live spontaneously before kind of the full weight of what was going to happen occurred. If that makes sense. Yeah, of course. I think so many, in fact, maybe most areas of this rare disease life is a bit of a double-edged sword. But what is interesting about it is that it makes you think, you know, and it forces you to process things at times, which perhaps you wouldn't have necessarily naturally done. I also think that perhaps when you're 18, the magnitude of the diagnosis delivery wasn't necessarily delivered, you know, and maybe they just didn't know much about it because obviously it's a rare disease. But telling a young man that it's fine and they don't have to do anything and worry about it until they're older seems pretty neglectful to me, but also so standard <laughs> in kind of how these diagnoses are sort of delivered. Because I wonder, like, was there any sort of interventions or just like watching of symptoms or any sort of treatment that could have helped manage things along the way in the beginning? I don't know. Again, that's that looking back stuff. But yeah, I think it was kind of a, a series of issues. I try to think of myself, you know, in the shoes of the doctor 
delivering the diagnosis at the time. I've had a lot of time to kind of replay that moment. I think really the issue, you know, if you think about it, it was 2005. There wasn't the magnitude of information that there is today about you know, my particular disease. Even then, it still isn't that much information about it. But, you know, going back 18 years now, there wasn't a lot of published literature about it. I think there's just a wide variance of symptoms, you know, symptom onset that I think they just kind of made their best guess as to what they expected progression would look like. I think too, you know, I kind of beat myself up. I may have just not fully understood what they were saying when they said later in life. Cause I think later in life, I think, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, many years in the future, but you know, later in life might've actually have met, you know, thirties, forties. And I was so preoccupied with the here and now the present going off to college that, you know, that still seems so far away. And I just wanted to get through college. I wanted to go experience that, enjoy myself that, you know, and the other thing too, is just kind of the expectation that sometime in the future, there would be some sort of treatment that might be able to, to stop it or reverse it. I had a lot of optimism about that without, you know, fully understanding the, the drug development process, something I, I understand and appreciate intimately now. But at the time, I just kind of said, okay, you know, they might find something years from now that could help me. So it's a little bit of everything, I think, just to, you know, and just there, there were no there were no treatments at the time and there still are no treatments for this disease. There might be one trial later this year, but that'd be really the first clinical trial for my condition. So, you know, just in the past 18 years, there really hasn't been anything on the drug development front. Don't exercise too much, but at the same time, you can't do too little because too little, your muscles are atrophy and die off, but too much, your muscles will die off. So you have to kind of like find that perfect medium. And they're like, you know, just get plenty of sleep. Don't be stressed. Of course, this is a very stressful disease. And so naturally, you know, that's a very tough, a tough uh, thing to follow. But, you know, just trying to do your best to, to manage the symptoms in the hopes that, you know, for so long, my hope is that I could just hold out until there was a treatment and try to maintain as much strength as possible. There's a lot to handle as a young adult with all this different advice, a lot of, you know, unknowns, everything is so vague because it's just a not at all understood disease. And, you know, just trying to, to navigate through that was, was, was challenging. And I think led to a lot of sort of the issues I had in trying to kind of come to grips with it as I entered, you know, my twenties and thirties. Earlier, you, you used language like ton of bricks and Pandora's box of emotions. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that when that sort of rush of reality finally hit you and how that impacted you. Yeah. So I was 23 years old when I got a reconfirmation of my diagnosis. So again, I'd been diagnosed at 18, but then I went to college and I had had no symptoms for kind of the next four years. So, you know, I didn't really think of it then, but when I got re-diagnosed, basically a confirmation of my original diagnosis at 23, when I was told, you know, expect to be in a wheelchair in the next 10 years, you're going to lose your ability to walk. You're not going to be able to run, climb stairs. You're going to lose a lot of independence that you used to have. That was the part that really hit me. Because again, I thought it was going to happen later in life and I didn't think it was even going to get that bad. I thought that maybe I'd just lose a little bit of strength. So to have kind of all of that sort of upended, you know, this this notion of where I thought my life was going to go, only to be told, you know, your life's about to look far different from what you had imagined and it's going to be a far more difficult path. That was a lot for me to handle, you know, first of all, the magnitude of the diagnosis itself, you know, what they were telling me, but also just the time of my life that I was in, you know, I was a very young adult, early 20s. I was living with, you know, my friends from college at the time in Boston. And over the next few years, I could see my friends advancing in life, hitting life milestones, getting married, buying houses, advancing in their careers, being able to travel spontaneously, go wherever they wanted to go, do things on a whim, things that I used to be able to do. And my day to day became consumed with, you know, am I going to make it through today without falling? What's the next milestone I'm going to hit in terms of an ability that I've just lost? And that was very difficult for me. So not only was I originally hit by a ton of bricks, I had to continue to be hit by a ton of bricks basically every day, just trying to kind of stay sane. And I'll admit, I did not handle that well. Looking back, I mean, it's easy in hindsight too, to kind of point out my mistakes. But at the time, I, did, I didn't handle things very well. And I'm not blaming myself, but it just, you know, it was a lot to deal with. It's a lot for anybody to deal with. 
but I made mistakes that I probably would not have made today in terms of really the number one thing was I just did not reach out for help. People knew I had it. My parents knew, my family knew, my friends knew, but I didn't really let them in on what it meant in terms of just like the full magnitude of what I was going through. Physically, they could see it. I think I kind of hid the emotional part. I don't want to say I was ashamed, but just I wasn't handling it well. I wasn't my best version of myself. I tried to take on things by myself. I tried to find ways to slow down the progression. I tried to, you know, do research on it. I tried to various things that I'd read about in terms of what to eat or supplements or something, and just nothing seemed to work. And that just kind of left me in a very dark place. And I was just getting very, very frustrated, very jealous of, you know, again, people my age that didn't have to deal with this, that, you know, continued to move forward in their lives. All of a sudden, I was kind of still stuck with this condition forced to kind of plan out in very excruciating detail every single day, like all the logistics, all the things that I used to not give two thoughts about, I now had to think about in terms of, you know, the route I took to work, you know, in terms of walking, making sure that I could walk on sidewalks that were not too bumpy, that I might trip and fall, or, you know, how heavy of a coat should I wear to the office? Because, you know, if it's too heavy of a coat, that's too much extra weight that I'd be carrying. When I pack my lunch, should I pack the big heavy Tupperware container full of food or should I just make a sandwich? Because again, all that extra weight was contributing to the likelihood that I might fall. Just little things like that. You know, do I take the bus versus take the subway? Because if I took the bus, then I might have to step onto the platform and struggle to get onto the step, onto the bus. Little things like that, that just really kind of added up to, to just make things really difficult for me. Yeah, I don't know what kind of Herculean human being can go through something like this and not go through all of those emotions and that anger and that grief. Mistakes are not, I think, that it's a process that is imperative to go through, hopefully not longer than you need to. But I've also found that, you know, like you mentioned, when you bury that stuff and when you hide it, it causes a whole other swarm of issues. Your story reminds me so much of my friend Adam Johnson, who is a mito patient, and he got symptoms on set like as an adult, but a much older adult. He was in his 30s, so way older. But, you know, he played basketball. He did all this stuff. And then all of a sudden this started happening. And, you know, he was kind of in denial about his symptoms for a while. And he, like you, turned to writing as an outlet. And he started a blog called The Rare Disease Dad, and he started talking about all of this stuff and processing his his losses and, you know, his his questions about the future. And so much of what you're saying is stuff that I have conversations with him about often. And you have two different websites right now, and I'm going to include both of them in the show notes. I highly recommend checking out both of them. The first one is sidewalksandstairwells.com. And the newest one is helloadversity.substack.com. Uh, like I said, the links will be in there. But Christopher, your writing is stunning. And something you talked about when you were relaying some of those early days of changes in your life made me remember a blog that I read about that you had written for The Mighty. And it was called To the Boy Who Stared at Me After I Fell on My Crutches. <laughs> oh my gosh, this blog post. Wow. I mean, as a parent to a kiddo in a wheelchair, like I even like deeply identified with this, with the stares that come to me as a parent and also the stares that come to my child. It was such an amazing article. And what I loved about it is you talk about how you were just like this perfectly like healthy, strong, strapping young dude. The symptoms happened. You bought a pair of crutches. Two weeks later, you're walking down the street and you tripped over a brick and you fell. And you, this little boy, this like four-year-old boy was just looking at you. And the article is so interesting because it's like your processing factor, you know, and you're, you're talking to this little boy about what it means to stare and what it means to not look back. When was it that you kind of had this, this change of perspective when you had kind of been going through the thick of it and you're in the trenches of this emotional and physical decline in a way? You started writing and then you also at some point decided that you had been isolated and you hadn't necessarily reached out to any sort of community or other people who were sort of living a similar life to you. How did those two things collide and when did they happen and what made you seek them out? Writing for me is 
kind of what exercise is for other people. You always hear about, you know, somebody going for a run and they had a chance to process whatever they're dealing with, whatever they're thinking about. And by the end of the run, they've kind of gained this clarity on what to do next. And that's kind of what writing has been for me. And especially was the outlet I needed early on because I couldn't exercise anymore because it was bad for my muscle disease to exert myself too much. And I really needed an outlet. And I'd always been a good writer, but I stopped doing it for a few years. I did it kind of, you know, for classes and stuff, writing papers, but you know, writing just became something that I that I really was able to help me. It was really able to help me be able to to process my emotions. I'd read a blog post that somebody else had written about their disease journey. And I'm like, wait a minute, I might be able to do that myself. And you know, I started writing about it. I started talking about my disease because, quite honestly, I'm more comfortable writing about what I'm going through than I am speaking about it. And Writing became therapeutic for myself, but it also helped people close to me be able to understand kind of what I was going through more honestly than maybe I had let on, you know, in a conversation. And and that's kind of what writing became for me. And over the years, my writing voice has evolved. I think, you know, things I might have written about at the time was through the lens of how, how I was perceiving it at the time. And I've grown in the last 10, 12 years. And, and you know, I might not necessarily write about stuff in the same way today, but everything I'd written was instrumental at the time in helping me to process what was happening. And I think just over time, I've been able to put my my story into kind of a narrative arc where I could better understand what had happened. Because it was a very traumatic experience to go from having full ability to all of a sudden, you know, losing the ability to, to walk, to, to fall on the ground constantly, to worry about falls, to, you know, not be able to do things that I used to be able to do the week before. All that was very difficult and it's really important to have an outlet. It's really important to be able to understand what's happening in a way that you're able to kind of take control of it and say, okay, this is my story. This is what has happened to me. These are my emotions as I was going through it. This is how I see it now. This is what I've learned. And writing has just been able to give me great context and clarity and perspective that I don't think I would have had or achieved had I not done it. And it's really opened a lot of doors for me. It's helped me connect to other people, other patients that have rare diseases, but even people that just, they don't have a disease, but they can share a lot of the same emotions that I've been through. Because one thing I've learned is that, you know, we're all dealing with something. My situation just happened to be physical. It's kind of what that, that Mighty article was you'd mentioned. You know, it's very obvious what my situation is in terms of my mobility level. But for a lot of people, they're hurting just as much emotionally. And it's really enabled me to connect with people, to be more empathetic than I probably would have been had I not gone through all of this and written about it. And it's just it's connected me to a lot of different people, people I never would have met had I not had this disease. So I think just in you know 12 years or so of writing about my disease, about my journey, obviously what I went through is incredibly difficult, but also it's given me a lot of perspective and a lot of, I'll say, positive benefits that I would not have been able to have if I didn't write about it. I have a lot of friends today that I would not have made had I not had this disease and had I not written about it and shared my story. So I try to focus on that, especially on the days when, you know, things are difficult. Because I still have difficult days. I still have days where I'm just like, this stinks. But it's given me a little bit more of a balanced perspective on, okay, you know, this is difficult, but, you know, here's all these doors that are now open that, you know, you should focus on rather than kind of dwelling on the ones that had closed. That makes sense. I love reading just kind of the evolution of not only your writing, but your your experience and your perspective shift along the way. And I think, you know, that's why people are here, right? That's why people are dipping into podcasts and writing their blogs and doing all of the things, whether they need to use someone's story as a lifeline, as as some sort of connective tissue, or if they're telling their story themselves. It's such an important part of our rare disease life. And like you said, it expands even beyond that, right? Because people can identify in pieces of your story, no matter what walk of life or difficult situation that they might be experiencing. And I think that when you can find that lifeline in a way, it gives you that extra breath, right? It gives you that other day that you can take another step if that's what you needed to kind of get going. And it's something you can lean on in those times when this just sucks. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really the, the beauty of, of storytelling in general. I benefited from others sharing their story, which gave me the confidence, and enabled me to, to write about my story. I've been lucky enough to have people that have connected with my story and then see them share their story. It's just kind of a wonderful feedback loop. So I think, you know, storytelling is, is so powerful in building connections, building empathy. The more stories that are out there of people kind of sharing their experience, I think that can ultimately be more persuasive. That can be more compelling than, you know, somebody just sharing statistics or facts alone. Like being able to share somebody's story in addition to that is how people are able to remember certain, whether it's an issue, whether it's, you know, somebody's disease journey, whether it's kind of just understanding what somebody's going through. By everybody sharing their stories and their different perspectives and experiences, that helps everybody. And I'm just one small contributor to that, but I've been helped by people that have done that, that have kind of paved the road for me to be able to do that myself. And that's kind of why I enjoy doing it, is just, you know, I can keep putting out stuff into the world that hopefully helps people, but also I can then connect with and read about other people's stories that, you know, help me and help other people as well. Yeah. And it's even beyond that, right? It sparks action. You know, it helps create treatments. It helps change laws. It goes so much further than you could ever imagine. And sometimes you don't even know. You know, when you were speaking, you made me kind of think about this idea. And I wanted to know if you could speak on it a little bit. So there's this idea that's kind of talked about all the time, right? Like people talk about toxic positivity. And then I also kind of see, especially being someone who's on social media a lot in this world, and I see like this other side to where it's almost too, I don't even know what to call it. I'm going to have to think of some toxic positivity opposite because it's almost like the affirmation of how you should feel bad and how everything does suck and how this is hard and to really dig into just that acceptance as well. And so there's kind of like these two polar opposites of identifying your emotions and dealing with them. And I wonder, how do you balance that sort of double-edged sword of, yes, accepting that this sucks and also, hey, I wouldn't be able to do this awesome thing if I didn't just accept it and think positively about it. Like, how do you find that middle area and the richness of it all while giving both of those things its space? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Actually, I kind of settled on this and I don't pretend to be the first person to think of it like this, but just it's kind of like being on a spectrum. On one end, you have the people that are just overwhelmingly negative, I guess, toxic negativity. I don't know. Oh, I'm going to call it toxic validation. Yeah. That's what I'm going to call it. Yeah, there's toxic positive. Yeah. I think either end, honestly, I think either end is toxic in its own way. I think on one end, you've got the people, and I've seen all sorts of people along the spectrum. And it's difficult because... You know, somebody's newly diagnosed and they encounter somebody's story. If the first person they encounter is super negative, you know, that could really shape kind of their outlook on their circumstances. You know, I think on one end, on that negative end, it's the people that have been completely jaded by their circumstances that feel cheated, that feel angry, that want to tear everybody else down with them. And I'm not here to say like somebody should or should not feel a certain way, because I understand that everybody's journey is different, their life experiences are different and you know, it's not easy to to deal with whether it's a life altering disease or some other trauma or some other experience that's difficult. I think we all kind of process it in our own ways, but there is that one end of the spectrum that's very negative. And then on the other end, there's the, as you were saying, kind of toxic positivity of people that are just super happy, super positive. They're always finding the silver linings. And I almost wonder too, it's like, are they really fully understanding and fully kind of processing what's happening? You know, it's the people that, you know, fall and break their leg, but they comment on how sunny the day is, how nice, you know, to see, you know, birds flying in the sky. And I come across those types of people too, or just like constantly just like, you know, I had a difficult day today, but you know, life is full of challenges and we're meant to overcome them. And it's just, yeah, it's true. But at the same time, it's like, I've kind of settled on, you know, if I could be positive, optimistic, 80, 90% of the time, I feel like that's kind of the healthiest place to be still gives you the 10 to 20% of the time where you can just acknowledge that this sucks. This isn't fun. I've had a rough day. I've encountered a failure or a setback that's been really crushing and it's just difficult to deal with. But, you know, you can deal with that for a little bit, but it doesn't have to consume you. So you don't end up on the negative end of the spectrum. You give yourself a little bit of time to grieve, a little bit of time to be upset. But then, you know, the next day you're able to kind of move forward again. 
I think that's really served me well because I have had difficult moments where I want to be really negative and angry and upset and jealous. But, you know, I, I want to also be able to kind of move forward with life and to kind of be able to move beyond that. But at the same time, I don't want to become so Pollyanna-ish that I just, you know, I'm not taking these challenges and obstacles for what they are. I'm not, you know, giving them their full weight. Because I think if you do that long enough, you're going to reach a point where you just, you snap. And, you know, all of a sudden, all the negativity comes rushing in and all the stuff that you've been glossing over and pushing off to the side comes flooding back. Then you end up in a very dark place. So I think giving yourself some room to handle the negative emotions, to feel bad, but also just overwhelmingly, not overwhelmingly, but more often than not, um, if you can be optimistic, I'd, I'd say I'd call that like realistic optimism, realistic positivity. I don't know if there's a right term for it, but just you're positive, but you know, you're know you doing so in a, in, a, in a realistic way that you can see kind of things for what they are. You don't get too down by them, but you also, again, are just not toxically positive or whatever term you want to use. That's kind of where I've netted out. So if I can just be like 80 to 90% of the time, you know, in a good mood, positive, but also, you know, I have that 10 to 20% of wiggle room where, you know, if I'm in, in extra pain today or if I'm just not feeling great or if something happened, maybe I lost another ability or something, I can give myself a little bit of time to sulk, a little bit of time to, to be frustrated or upset, but I don't let it consume me. Yes, I feel that. And thank you for that thoughtful answer. It kind of reminds me of this new show on Apple TV called Shrinking with Indiana Jones. But he he's like a therapist in it and he teaches people to allow themselves 15 minutes a day to grieve. And it kind of just reminds me of that, of like making those spaces for that kind of emotional, mental state, but not getting stuck in it. Yeah, it, it's through a lot of trial and error that I arrived at that. That's something that, you know, I didn't realized from day one, I think I definitely fell into the more negative side of the spectrum early on because I just was focusing on all the things that were happening that were difficult, all the bad things. I didn't see any positive things. And I've kind of just kind of recalibrated over the years to kind of reach that equilibrium that works for me. And I think that just kind of helped me be able to maintain, you know, over time, a, a greater sense of overwhelming hope. It's not necessarily the answer, but just like optimism that just like, you know, I've been through so much. This thing that might be coming up will be difficult. Yes, it stinks, but you know I've handled it before. I can do it again. I'll deal with it. I'll get through it. And that, that's really helped. You've really accomplished more than most people do without an illness. And it's really impressive. I mean, your writing, your advocacy, your career, college. I was hoping that maybe you could... Give a little pep talk to the patients listening who are feeling a little defeated and also to the caregivers who are so worried about what the future looks like for their kids. I think giving yourself time to lament, to grieve, if something difficult happening or you're going through something difficult, to accept that, to say, okay, you know, things are hard, to not beat yourself up and to give yourself confidence that you will get through it. I think again, what really helped me was connecting to other people, to find role models, to find people that have a similar circumstance to you, whether it's the same disease, whether it's a similar type of disease, whether it's no disease at all, but just somebody that's kind of exhibits some of the qualities or some of the characteristics that you want to embody, to find people who have shared their stories of how they've gotten through similar challenges, to connect with people, to find people in your community, in terms of like your rare disease community or, or you know, whatnot. The one thing I learned is that you can't go through this alone. We can't achieve success alone. We can't deal with all of our challenges alone. Some people want to, some people default to that because they don't want to open up or they're just, they might be embarrassed or they might feel overwhelmed or just not in a good headspace to be able to do that. But what I learned, and, and this is again from trial and error, is the sooner you do that, the sooner you are able to connect with other people, the sooner you're able to find, again, exemplars, role models, whatever you want to call them, of people that have achieved what you want to achieve or done what you want to have done, the better off you'll be in the long run. And I think just thinking in terms of you might have to do things differently than you might have originally intended. You know, for me, a lot of what I've accomplished and done looks far different than the way that I would have expected had I not had a disability. But 
again, there are people that have done the things you want to do, whether it's get a degree or start a family or travel. It'll be, it might be a little bit more difficult. It might be completely different from what you expected, but people are doing it. People are accomplishing it. And just remembering that there's always examples of people that have done something because it, it can be easy. And I know that from firsthand experience to kind of fall into the camp of like, this is too difficult. Or there's just no way that I'm going to be able to get through this or no way I'm going to be able to do this, or this is too hard. And there's all sorts of larger issues at play in terms of just, you know, obviously it'd be better if the world was more accessible and make things easier. But given that there are people that have managed to, to, to find a way, and, and that doesn't mean that you can't also advocate at the same time as you're doing that. It's not mutually exclusive. It's not, you persevere through your challenges, but you can't, you know, speak up about something should be done differently or something should be easier or less of a hassle. But, you know, there are people that can show you the way that can kind of light the path. And that was really what kind of turned things around for me was just being able to connect with people like that, to find other people with my disease, to find other stories of people that have, you know, accomplished what I want to accomplish while dealing with a health challenge or disability or whatever, some other great uh, hardship of some sort. That's what really made a difference for me. And I think, you know, if you're, you're contemplating doing something or you're struggling with something, the sooner you can connect to other people, they don't have to have the exact circumstances you're going through. But somebody that can understand, at least on an emotional level, some of the, the issues you're facing will make such a world of difference because there's people out there that have made the mistakes already. They've learned the lessons and they can help to you to avoid those pitfalls. You know, again, one of my greatest regrets was that I did not seek that out sooner. It took me three years, four years to do that. But once I did do that, that really made a major difference in my life. Amen. Finding others is like the most <laughs> unspoken sense of relief and I recommend it to everyone, clearly. <laughs> okay, Christopher, well, can you please tell everybody again where they can find your beautiful writing and how they can contact you? Yeah, so just to complicate things, I added a second writing website in the time that we first scheduled this to now. So I have my, I guess it's a blog of sorts. Uh, it's called Sidewalks and Stairwells. That was kind of, again, the site where I started writing to kind of process what was happening in my life. So that's really more geared towards my personal story. If you're interested in learning about my journey over the years, I think I started it in 2013 or so. So I've been writing it for about 10 years or so now. And my new site within the last couple months, it's called Hello Adversity, which is more of a newsletter. And it's, it's, it's a little bit different from my Sidewalks and Sterile site in the sense that I wanted a, a space where I could kind of write about my story, but kind of take some of the learnings from my story and be able to apply it to other people. Because now that I've written about my story for 10 years, I kind of reached a point where I wanted to see if I could pull out some of the things that I've learned and to be able to kind of repackage it in a way that could be useful for others. So the, the great thing about Hello Adversity is that I take, you know, different lessons I've learned, different resilient strategies, and that sort of thing. And every two weeks, I, I write about one particular topic. I, I kind of weave in my story as needed to kind of show, you know, my process to come to that conclusion or to, to kind of surface that learning in my own life and, and to be able to kind of repackage it for others to be able to apply to their own lives. I try to make it accessible to everybody. And, you know, I really enjoy doing that. It's, it's keeping me on a writing schedule, which is something that I've needed for a long time. And um, it's free to sign up. You can follow me at Hello Adversity. The site is helloadversity.substack.com and on my personal blog, Sidewalks and Stairwells, which is, and this is one word, sidewalksandstairwells.com. Thanks so much for having me today. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story, or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate you all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you.